Hi, this is Lecture 8 on Blockchain Scalability. Let's start with talking about what are the scalability problems for blockchain databases. Well, there's two scaling problems that we'll talk about. One is transaction throughput. This is how many transactions, say, per second can the blockchain database process. And another scaling problem is storage. Now, there's also two different types of storage. There's the active storage, storage that's actually required in order to validate transactions. And there's archival storage, or old storage, which is just required for historical validation of transactions. So focusing first on transaction throughput, there is two possible bottlenecks. One is that the consensus protocol which we haven't talked about in detail yet, other than the Bitcoin consensus protocol at a very basic level. But the consensus protocol is the protocol that multiple, multiple validators of a blockchain database would run in order to agree on transactions before they're committed to the database. Often consensus protocols are the bottleneck for transaction throughput, um, and they place a limit of a fixed rate of, uh, of blocks per second. So solutions to get around this are either A, well, just increase the block size, increase the number of transactions per, uh, per block that is agreed upon in the consensus protocol. So agree on more transactions in one go. Or develop faster consensus protocols. And when we get to discussing the variety of consensus protocols in the next few lectures, we'll see that there are different fundamental trade-offs um, that balance different types of security models for consensus protocol with the ability to run the consensus faster. Another possible bottleneck is verification time. So this has nothing to do with um, agreement among multiple validators. It just has to do with the raw time that it takes to actually process the transactions. And this can present a bottleneck equally for a blockchain database that's run by a single validator in a more traditional database model, or when there's multiple validators. So solutions for scaling the verification time include uh, concepts that we'll discuss in this lecture, such as off-chain transactions. Um, these are payment and state channels, and I'll teach you what those are. Sharding which is the technical term for dividing the work of validating transactions or splitting the database into multiple smaller parts, each of which are easier to deal with, as well as verifiable computation, which is a powerful tool from cryptography. And that's the last tool that we'll, we'll talk about how to use. So it's important to consider the operational setting of the blockchain database before launching into a discussion of scalability, because the operational setting has a big impact on which scalability problems are most important. So several different operational settings that we can consider are, as I mentioned, a single validator, one where there's only one database manager, there's no consensus protocol, so that's not a concern. But there may be multiple auditors who are trying to keep up with the single validator and make sure that the single validator is not committing bad or invalid transactions to the database. And then there's multiple validators or a distributed governance model where transactions can only be committed to the database, or in other words, transactions are only fully processed by the database and become officially part of the, um, of the database once all the validators participating in the distributed governance have reached an agreement. And this is called consensus, and consensus strains both the latency, meaning the, the delay between when a transaction is submitted and when it's actually accepted, as well as the throughput, which is the number of transactions that the database can actually get through per second. You can think of this as the difference between latency and throughput is latency is the time it takes for you to wait for your payment to go through. And throughput is the number of payments that, say, um, a database processing payments could actually process every second. So the, 
throughput is usually the 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 more important term when we talk about scalability. It, it's the ability of the database to handle many, many, many users at once. But differences in latency also affect the user experience. So users don't want to have to wait a long time for their payment to be processed. Now another concern for the setting of multiple validators is that different validators may operate at different speeds or capacity. There is a balance here between the need for high performance and the need for open participation, which is the whole point of having multiple validators. And if we want to expand the participation to be very, very open, we can't necessarily expect every validator participating to be running a high performance database. And in general, the performance will scale like the weakest validator, unless we use some other tricks to get around this. So let's proceed. Let's talk first about the single validator setting. The single validator setting is more like the traditional database model. And scalability problems look mostly the same as the standard scalability problems in standard high performance databases. The database manager can use parallel processing as well as dividing the storage over multiple machines. Sharding, again, is a technical term for partitioning the database into smaller parts called data shards. And these smaller data shards are easier to manage independently. Cross shard transactions is a term that refers to transactions which are involving more than one shard. So if you split the database into multiple parts, uh, that's very convenient when the transactions only affect one part at a time. And so you can naturally partition the transactions and treat each separate piece of the database as its own smaller database. But when transactions then involve data from more than one shard, that becomes a difficult challenge to solve. Um, but still, these are all types of problems that happen in standard high performance databases. And we're not going to, this really isn't a course on, on, um, on high performance database management, but all the same solutions that apply there also apply to blockchain databases. There are some unique challenges in the single validator setting um, that are unique to blockchains as opposed to just any transactional database. And these come from the types of operations that are done in blockchains, um, such as the expensive cryptography operations. So authenticated data structures, as well as verifying digital signatures on transactions or zero knowledge proofs, which you learned about in the last few lectures on privacy techniques. They all introduce overhead and crypto operations tend to be expensive. So this is an area where we can, where, where we really need to do some, um, you know, unique study of, of methods for, for speeding up those operations in order to make the throughput of transaction verification very high. So the main important technique um, for dealing with, exp with, with expensive cryptography operations are techniques for checking multiple signatures or proofs in a batch faster than individually. Uh, and batch verification techniques are generally specific to the different types of signatures or proofs that we may use or encounter, and they're beyond the scope of what we'll cover in this course. Now, even in the setting of a single validator, we're still concerned about auditing or scalable auditing. Remember that even in the, 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 the single validator setting, there are, would be many third party auditors that would have to be watching this um, single validator and making sure that it's processing transactions correctly. Otherwise, the blockchain property of, of transparency would not be fully utilized, right? Things like immutability are only achieved if third party auditors are really doing the work to, trans to check transaction validity in order to catch the main database manager if it does something wrong. So auditors who are trying to check the validity of all transactions would need to process at the same rate as the main database. Even if the auditors are not the bottleneck for transaction throughput at this point, 
in order to check that the validator is operating correctly, they would need to process at the same rate. Now, auditors may not be running a high performance database. Ideally, auditors could be just like normal users, right? So this introduces a question, which is, can the main database, which is a high performance database, help these weaker auditors, say normal users, check the same transactions faster without redoing all the same work? We don't want to ask auditors or require of auditors to be as high performant as the main database. So can the main database help them verify that the transactions were correct without having them redo all the same work? And a related question is, can multiple auditors divide the work okay, without trusting each other? This question of how to divide the work among multiple auditors in a single validator setting is very related to the scalability problem that arises in the setting of multiple validators. So here, multiple validators will be running a consensus protocol to approve transactions. So now they're, they're the, the approval of all validators becomes a bottleneck for transaction throughput. It adds latency. It's naturally much slower to ensure agreement among multiple validators. And in an ex in extreme example, the Bitcoin latency is 10 minutes. So you have to wait 10 minutes until your payment is actually confirmed. Um, it also affects throughput. You can increase the number of transactions per block that is agreed upon in the consensus protocol. So in Bitcoin, you, you could decide to increase the number of transactions per block that's agreed upon every 10 minutes, but this still hits a limit and you hit communication bottlenecks. Right now you're still sending more transactions over the network, trying to communicate and agree upon them with all other validators. So you can't just arbitrarily increase the number of transactions per block. That doesn't quite work. So as an extreme example, Bitcoin throughput is only three transactions per second, which is very, very small. It would never scale to replace, say, Visa for payments. And remember, the slowest validator is a bottleneck, right? So if all multiple, if all validators need to participate in consensus and not all validators are running a high performance database, then the database performs as, as bad as the, as, as, as the slowest validator. So our question is, can validators divide the work of verifying transactions without changing the trust model, without having to trust each other? And this is basically the same question as whether auditors can divide the work. Only that with auditors, we care more about, with auditors, there's a bit more flexibility because they are not a bottleneck for transaction latency or throughput. And validators not only need to divide the work, but they need to be able to do this and still get those transactions through as fast as possible in real time. Auditors are not operating in real time. So let's go over some of the solutions at a high level that we'll encounter in the rest of the lecture. So the first is the concept of a payment channel or a state channel. Uh, a state channel, or off, often referred to as off-chain transactions in the blockchain lingo, is a concept that users can transact directly without involving the database at all. Okay. In other words, you could use the blockchain database only for net settlement, where say Alice buys coffee from Bob every day, but they only need to send a transaction to the blockchain database at the end of the month to settle their overall balance. Now this naturally reduces the strain on blockchain performance in all operational settings. Whether you're in a single validator or a multiple validator setting, obviously sending fewer transactions to the database is better for scalability. So payment channels are a very, very important technique, and that will be the first one that we'll cover. The next technique that we'll look at are fraud proofs and snarks. So fraud proofs are the concept that someone can prove that some transaction was validated incorrectly 
and verifying that proof does not require too much work. So if one person, say one auditor, is searching through the transaction history and finds a bad transaction, they can send that to everyone else and the other auditor, the, the other auditors in the network can just directly verify that even if they're not necessarily storing all the information in the database or they're not, they don't have to go through and verify everything um, at once and they can just verify this proof of incorrect validation. Then naturally the auditors could divide the work and search different par parts of the, of the transaction database in order to discover fraudulent activity and then send it to one another. So that's not a perfect solution because it's still, you know, no single auditor is actually verifying the entire uh, database of transactions. So they're relying on other people to discover fraudulent activity. But a more powerful solution is verifiable computation, or SNARKs. This is a technique that allows one party to produce a proof that the initial validation was correct. So a proof that, say, some block of transactions um, is valid. And that proof can be verified much faster than redoing all the work of verifying the block of transactions. So this is a very powerful tool. And we'll look at that last. So let's first talk about payment channels. So as I mentioned, the concept is we will use the blockchain for net settlement only. I gave the example of Alice buying coffee from Bob every day. Alice only wants to settle on the block, or Alice and Bob only want to settle on the blockchain once a month, but Bob doesn't want to take any risk. The naive solution would be for Alice and Bob to just have an oral agreement that they would do this at the end of the month, but we're trying to have some kind of interaction between them that doesn't require them to be close friends. So here's a straw man proposal. Deposit 100 coins into a shared account. We'll call this account E. And what does it mean for this account to be shared? Well, the account requires signatures from both parties in order to withdraw cash. This is called a two out of two multi-sig escrow in the Bitcoin lingo or more generally in the blockchain lingo. If you've heard the word multi-sig escrow, this is that concept. So here's what the two parties will do. And remember, it's a straw man, so it doesn't quite work, but we're trying to give you the intuition um, of where we're going to go with this. So on day one, A for Alice signs a first transaction, which says this account E pays out one coin to B and 99 coins to A. And then on the next day, Alice buys coffee from Bob again and signs a new transaction that says E pays two coins to B and 98 coins to A. And so on and so forth. At the end of the month, Bob ends up signing or co-signing the last transaction. So it has a signature from both Alice and Bob. And it says this account E pays out uh, now 30 coins to, to Bob and 70 coins to A. So that seems like it works. But at least it, it works for Bob, right? Bob doesn't take any risk because these transactions need Bob's signature as well. And Bob is signing Alice's transaction, paying him one coin more every day. Everything seems okay for Bob, but it's not okay for Alice. The problem is that if Bob doesn't co-sign anything, then Alice loses all of her 100 coins. They don't go to Bob, but they're locked up inside this escrow account. So we need a better solution. So we'll describe a solution that uses a smart contract, which you learned about in lecture four from Benedict, 
And it's possible to design solutions for this without smart contracts. In fact, there are designs of solutions for this that work with Bitcoin, but they're more complicated to explain. So we'll start with describing a smart contract. And for extra reading on the side, you can go look up how they work with Bitcoin. So the goal is to design a payment channel using stateful contract. The contract is going to contain um, state variables. Okay. The three state variables are going to be mode, a balance split, and a counter. I'll show you how they appear. So the modes are basically saying what state is the contract in. There's going to be three different modes. There's going to be an init mode, a pending mode, and a closed mode. Don't worry, we'll see how each of these behave. So upon initialization, this is just like a fancy version of the escrow account, the simple escrow account that we just described. So upon initialization, Bob and Alice submit an open transaction to open this uh, fancy joint account. And the open transaction will set the initial balance split, remember balance split is one of our variables, to be Alice 100 and Bob 0. So this is the balance split. And this extra term over here is what we're going to call the counter. So since this is the first transaction, it has a count of zero. So to pay Bob $1, say the next day, Alice won't send any transaction to this contract. It will, she will just send Bob a signed transaction with an incremented counter, right? So this is the incremented counter. With a new balance split of 99 for Alice and one for Bob. When they're ready to settle the net balance, say after some time has passed, right? Then they will issue a transaction called close, okay? And close will be of the same form. It will submit a transaction that has a balance split value and a sequence number signed by both Alice and Bob. And this, um, this enters the pending mode. In the pending mode, we don't immediately close out the transaction. There's a delay of one day. Why is there a delay of one day? Well, in the pending state, a new closed transaction with a higher sequence number could be heard and sent to this contract. And that new closed transaction with a higher sequence number would again trigger a one day wait. So eventually, the latest transaction with the highest sequence number that has been signed by both Alice and Bob will be received in the pending state. One day will pass and it will not receive, it will not, it will, it's impossible for it to receive any transaction with a higher sequence number because this is the transaction with the highest sequence number. And then it will enter the closed state where it actually pays out the final balance that it heard to Alice and Bob. So in this example, we opened with 100 and zero. The contract received a closed transaction with a split of 50-50, but actually that was an invalid closed transaction because it was not the latest state of the balance split. In the pending state, we heard another closed transaction with a higher sequence number two that actually has a balance split of 20 for Alice and 80 for Bob. And so the final closure of the channel pays 20 out to Alice and 80 to Bob. Why is this secure? Well, it's impossible to close the balance with a split that hasn't been signed by both Alice and Bob. And the only thing that 
a party could do in order to try to do something fraudulent would be to try to close with an outdated balance split. So in this example, if Alice tries to close with the outdated balance split of 50-50 with sequence number one, then Bob will cry foul and send a new closed star transaction with the correct split and a higher sequence number. Now, it's a, it's a little silly, I was describing it just for simplicity, to have this pending transaction trigger one plus one day all the time, because we know that if the first party sent an invalid closed transaction, then that, in, that first party um, is doing something fraudulent. So we could just introduce, we could just immediately close the channel and pay out the, the new closed star to Bob. We don't need to necessarily give Alice a, a chance to redeem herself and um, give a... If, if both Alice and Bob are trying to cheat the channel, then we don't necessarily need, need, to, uh, need to give them both a chance to indefinitely submit new transactions with higher sequence numbers. We can just close the channel immediately with the, with, with the higher sequence number. And we could also introduce penalties to discourage fraudulent attempts in the first place, because fraudulent attempts put strain on the blockchain database. So the contract could just immediately penalize A, once it hears this closed star transaction, it could penalize A for submitting the outdated closed transaction of 50-50 in the first place. And this could be, this penalty could be in the form of paying out the entire initial balance to Bob. So Bob would get 100 and Alice would get zero. Or there could be even additional collateral posted um, that Alice loses if she ever submits an invalid closed transaction. And same for Bob. So more generally, this gives us a way of doing state channels. So payments are really just one special case. We could absolutely generalize the concept to an arbit arbitrary state channel which holds information other than a balance split. So if this were some other type of smart contract that is not just dealing with payment, simple payments from one party to another, then we, we can apply exactly the same concept. But the main takeaway is that in channels, transactions only hit the blockchain twice. Once to open the channel, and deposit some collateral in, in the smart contract escrow account. And then once to close the channel for net settlement. Now, we can actually, the, the problem with a, with, with a channel as we described so far is that it still requires Alice and Bob to establish a joint channel between them. And this would require every pair of party in the, in the network who would ever want to send each other money to establish a, a channel between them. A better way of doing this might be to establish an overlay network of state channels, which means that, say, Alice and Bob do not have a state channel or payment channel directly between them, but Alice has a state channel with another party in the network, who has a state channel with another party in the network, which forms a pass over the network to Bob. This is how the internet works, in fact, right? If I want to send a message, if Alice wants to say, send an email to Bob, Alice and Bob don't necessarily have a direct physical channel between them, but Alice is going to be able to connect to her internet provider, which then sends a message along a series of links that eventually reaches Bob. And then it becomes just a routing problem of how do we figure out some road from Alice to Bob over this network. We apply the same concept to state channels, so we don't need every pair of parties to establish a state channel between them. A payment from Alice to Bob can be routed over any multi-hop path, multi path of channels as long as each edge or link of the path contains sufficient collateral to cover the payment. So this is a concept that was um, developed in particular for the Bitcoin network by a company called uh, Lightning. And so the most famous example of this implemented in practice is Lightning Network.
There are several advantages of channels that don't have to do with scalability. So I would like to mention them here um, since we just introduced channels. Micropayments are a great example. Micropayments are transactions that send tiny amounts. Could be smaller than even the minimum transaction fee. So examples of this could include uh, paying for music, buying music online, or paying for a web advertisement. There are many other examples where the size of the transaction is very, very, very small. Size meaning the, the amount that's being transferred. And if every transaction that actually goes to the blockchain database costs something, naturally it would because someone has to actually run that data center to process it, then it could be really infeasible to, to, to actually use the blockchain for micropayments. And the way micropayments are dealt with in normal databases are through net settlement. So having a way to do net settlement over using, using digital signatures um, is very powerful, right? So channels are ideal for micropayment transactions. Transactions in a channel are completely free of cross. They don't actually go through the main database provider. And similarly, we can avoid high transaction costs to update smart contracts. So if the blockchain database is processing complicated programs, then there is a cost associated with that. And in fact, in practice, Ethereum smart contracts can have very high gas costs. Gas are basically the Ethereum's model for pricing uh, transactions, and these can be very high for complicated contracts. So the ability to process things in a channel um, reduces costs. Now on to the next topic, load balancing. So load balancing is about dividing the work of transaction verification or storage among multiple distrusting parties. And this could apply in, to multiple validators or to multiple auditors. We'll talk about sharding, which is load balancing transaction verification. And the two main techniques that we'll cover here are fraud proofs and snarks. And we can also talk about load balancing the storage, which uses authenticated data structures. In fact, we already talked about using authenticated data structures for load balancing storage in lecture three. So, Sharding straw man number one. Again, I'm going to describe to you something that doesn't quite work, but we're building up the intuition. Let's say we just split the blockchain database into N independent blockchains. Call each independent blockchain a sh blockchain shard. The shards are going to have independent states. For example, they could be processing different types of coins. Naturally, you already have this in blockchains. You have the Bitcoin blockchain, which handles Bitcoins, and you have the Ethereum blockchain, which handles Ether. And they're going to have independent smart contracts. So shards, and these shards are going to have different sets of validators, and these shards are going to run consensus completely independently. What are the problems? Well, one, we didn't solve the trust problem at all. This would only work if the validators trust each other, okay? To give an example, unless the Ethereum validators trust the Bitcoin validators, then the Ethereum validators have no idea whether Bitcoin is valid or not, whether transactions are, are valid in Bitcoin or not. They're com two completely independent systems. So we haven't solved any scalability problem, we've just artificially divided the blockchain into N independent parts and assume that the validators on one shard don't care about what's happening on the other shard. Unless they trust the other shard uh, validators completely. Now the other challenge is that um, this only really works if the state can naturally be partitioned like this, right? If there is a natural partitioning of types of coins or independent smart contracts, cross-shard transactions would still be a challenge. So let's improve this a little bit. So one problem with straw man number one is that an attacker would only need to corrupt one over n fraction of the validators in order to cause forks on one of the blockchains. So forks are 
the technical term for disagreement among validators on the state of the database. So remember, we haven't really talked about consensus in detail yet, but you did learn a little bit about it in Bitcoin. And we talked about what a Bitcoin fork was. Um, so if you have multiple validators um, split into n different groups, then in this case, the attacker of strawman one is trying to cause confusion among different validators over what is, say, the state of shard number one. Uh, the strawman in, in strawman number one, the attacker would only need to corrupt the validators who are in charge of shard number one in order to cause confusion in the network over what is the state of shard number one. So the first idea would be to keep a root blockchain with all validators participating. And the job of this root blockchain is just to resolve disagreements, but not to verify transaction validity. So transaction validity and agreement are two different problems. It could be that one of the shards is double spending money or creating money out of thin air. And that is definitely a problem but it is a distinct problem from causing confusion or disagreement in the network. At least the network will completely agree on what is the balance in everyone's account, even if they're not sure that all those balances are completely correct or compliant with the rules of the financial system. So the idea is that the, the root blockchain is going to just contain the state commitments of each of the n shards. So what is the problem? Well, the problem is, of course, that if the adversary compromises validators on one shard, then it can improve invalid transactions. So it's not quite good enough. Can we leverage somehow the root ledger in order to resolve this? This brings us to the concept of fraud proofs. So first, remember state commitments are using an authenticated data structure, as we talked about in lecture three, in order to commit to in using with a succinct small value to the entire state of a blockchain, a blockchain database. In this case, <clears throat> the root blockchain is going to store a state commitment for each of the N blockchain shards. An example of a uh, a blockchain database state um, would be Bitcoin. It, um, in Bitcoin, the state is just the UTXO set, the set of currently spendable coins. In other words, valid records of coin ownership. And in Bitcoin, verifying a transaction only requires checking that all the inputs to a transaction are valid. All the coins that are being spent in the transaction are in the current UTXO set. And then additionally, checking some local information contained in the transaction data, such as uh, that the sum of the amounts of the input coins is greater than the sum of the outputs, or equal. So the state commitment is, again, a dynamic, authenticated data structure. In this example of Bitcoin, it would be a authenticated data structure that represents the UTXO set. Remember from lecture three that we call such authenticated data structures accumulators. And an example implementation would be a Merkle tree. So the state commitment would be the Merkle tree root. Validity of a coin or a transaction output would be proved with a Merkle path relative to this Merkle root. So now let's see how to use this. This is a simplification of a design out there called Plasma, which um, was proposed for scaling transactions in Ethereum, but is generally applicable to um, you know, all blockchain designs. So this is the concept. The root blockchain keeps two things for each shard. One, the state commitment for the shard state. For example, a Merkle root for the UTXO set, if we're looking at um, the Bitcoin uh, a blockchain database that is similar to Bitcoin. Um, 
Or if, if we're looking at a blockchain database that looks more like Ethereum, then this could be a, a sparse Merkle tree, as we learned about in lecture three, for a key value table of accounts and balances or smart contracts in their state, etc. The second thing that the root blockchain needs to keep track of for each shard is a Merkle root for the transactions in each shard update. Right, so remember we have this, this root blockchain and it's evolving over time, but if you look at what is in any given block, it has a list for each of the one through n shards of just the state commitment and the that so it's going to have a state state commitment so sc1 through scn and then over here there's going to be some uh, this is what i'm talking about here like a merkle root for the transactions in the update it is a commitment to the transactions that went from the last state of every shard to the next state of every shard. Now, once we have this in place, we're going to use fraud proofs. So the concept of a fraud proof is that if some shard X, one of these shards, sends an update to a state commitment, that includes invalid transactions, then the users or auditors could challenge the update. And the process would be that a whistleblower or auditor would post the ID of the transaction that was invalid and claim fraud. The validators of shard X in response would be challenged to produce the transaction content, which was committed in the Merkle root, with authentication proofs, so Merkle paths for the transaction and all of its inputs. And then the, if, if the validators are unable to produce this defensive proof of transaction validity, then the whistleblower would be able to collect, say, a reward. In pictures, we have here the root blockchain. And so this is shard x which is one of the shards that are we are keeping track of remember that every shard has a table of state commitments one through n for each shard so this is this would be st1 through stn and we're looking now at the x shard so this has stx in addition we have a commitment to the utxo set this is the set of valid coins in shard X, taking this to be similar to the Bitcoin example, um, as well as transactions I, which are the set of transactions that transitioned us from the I minus first set to the I set. So if some party believes that one of the transactions in this ith transaction set txsi is invalid, then they will challenge the validators of shard x to produce a defensive proof. And the defensive proof would need to give Merkle proofs to show that the challenged transaction and all inputs in the challenged transaction are in the ith utxo set and all outputs are in the i plus first UTXO set, as well as the transaction, of course, would have to be valid, so all the local information in the transaction would need to be correct, showing, for example, that the sum of the inputs is balanced with the sum of the output amounts. Now, if the validators of shard X fail to produce a acceptable defensive proof, then they would lose some posted collateral um, for failing this defensive proof. And of course, more complex state transition proofs are possible. We were just giving the simplest example of a blockchain database that operates like Bitcoin.
So the last tool that we'll explain are SNARKs. SNARKs are used for something called verifiable computation. In lectures five through seven, you saw zero knowledge proofs or proofs that a statement is true without the revealing the details of why. You can think of zero knowledge proofs as a proof that a computation was done correctly without revealing all of the internal steps. Now, a snark is a succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge, which is a proof that a computation was done correctly, but that is much smaller than the transcript of all the steps and can be verified much faster than the computation itself. So snarks take the, sa take the same concept of proving something about the correctness of a computation, but they're less immediately concerned with privacy or the details of what transpired and more concerned about the efficiency. Now, of course, snarks can also be made zero knowledge. And so you can think of zero knowledge snarks as just a very efficient zero knowledge proof. It is not revealing the details of the internal steps of the computation or the reason why some statement is true. But in addition, it is much smaller than the transcript of all the steps of the computation and can be verified much faster than the computation itself. So ZK rollup is the blockchain lingo term for how we can use snarks in order to divide the work among multiple validators and auditors of verifying transactions, and then send snark proofs that attest that each of the individual validators or auditors did their portion correctly without requiring the other validators to redo that work. So in the context of sharding, each shard could process its own transactions, produce a snark proof of correctness for say one every 100 blocks, and then the root ledger would only receive just the state commitment updates, the commitment to the transactions in the update. So for example, these would be a Merkle root for the state commitment and a separate Merkle root for the commitment to transactions in the update. And then in addition, a snark proof of validity that all the committed transactions in the update are actually valid. And in a zero knowledge version of this, we can actually keep the transactions on each shard private from the rest of the network. All validators will verify the proof sent to the root ledger. Um, but in the zero knowledge version, all, not all validators would actually know what transactions happened on each shard. They would only know that they were valid. Um, we of course don't need to always apply the zero knowledge version. It depends on um, it depends very much on the setting and what kind of blockchain database we're running. So let's also talk about low storage validators. The concept of a low storage validator is a validator that only stores a sequence of state commitments and doesn't actually need to store any other information at all. So in the example of, um, of Bitcoin, a validator would not need to store the UTXO set they would only need to store the Merkle roots of the UTXO sets. Instead, attached to each transaction would be validity proofs. So for example, Merkle proofs for all the inputs involved in the transaction. Validators would then update state commitments after each new block of transactions. And the trade-off is that this increases the size of each transaction and also the time to verify it but it reduces the storage that is actually required of the validators. RSA accumulators, which we saw in lecture three, are actually a very useful tool um, as a Merkle tree replacement for solving the problem of low storage validators because they can be used to, they have special properties that allow for batching and aggregating of proofs, which can lead to smaller transaction size overhead and verification time, which is the main trade-off of this low storage validator approach. But low storage validators achieve a separation 
from data storage providers or availability providers and validators who are really just there in order to make sure that transactions are correct. So this is a convenient separation of roles, which means that we can use um, either entirely different parties or just a different solution for scaling the data and storage um, capability of the blockchain database and scaling the set of validators who are actually in charge of making sure the transactions to the database are correct. For example, it, it allows for a frequent random shuffling of validators among shards. So let's say that we split the validators among different shards, but we don't want to keep every validator confined to one shard. We want to shuffle them around. Well, because we now have a separation between the validators and the data storage providers, we don't actually have to move the data between the validators when we shuffle validators on different shards. In the extreme case, in fact, only users really need to store their own UTXOs or account data, and nobody would actually need to store the whole blockchain. So finally, I'll talk about recursive snarks. And recursive snarks are going to give us a, a technique for building basically a constant size blockchain. And I will explain how a constant size blockchain offers something which is even more powerful than ZK rollup. The concept of a recursive snark is given a snark proof for some computation, say computation on input X is equal to zero. We can produce an updated snark proof for a new computation C of Y equals zero, but this updated proof says both C of X equals zero and C of Y equals zero. A naive solution would be just to redo the entire proof for the new combined statement, but this would require twice the amount of work. We would have to prove both C of X equals zero and C of Y is equal to zero. A second naive solution would be to produce a new proof pi prime just for the second one, C of Y equals zero, and output both of the proofs, both the proof that C of X equals zero and the new proof that C of Y equals zero. The problem is that then the proof would have twice the size. So this leads me to the point, which is that a recursive snark produces a new statement of the same size. So a, a proof that is the same size as the previous proof. And this single proof says that C of Y is equal to true is true. And it also proves knowledge of this previous proof pi that proves that C of X is equal to true. Now, the savings are only possible because snarks are compressing, both in size and verification time. Remember, the whole point of a snark is that verifying a proof takes less work than verifying the original statement. And it is also smaller than the transcript or the size of the original compu computation. So this means that proving knowledge of a proof is more efficient than proving the original statement directly. So proving knowledge of the previous proof that C of X equals zero and proving C of Y is equal to zero can be done more efficiently than just reproving C of X equals zero and C of Y equals zero from scratch. Now note that this is actually only true in an asymptotic sense, for a very small computation, say like checking that one is not equal to zero, which is a very, very small trivial thing to verify, this would not at all be true because the overhead of producing a snark proof from that would be too high. But it is true in an asymptotic sense once the size of the computation that you're proving becomes very large. So for example, verifying all historical blockchain transactions, it would be once someone has produced a proof that all historical blockchain transactions are correct, verifying a proof is faster than verifying all the transactions from scratch. So 
Think of this concept as a proof of a proof. So we have a, a new proof pi, pi one that c of y is equal to zero and that I know a proof pi zero that c of x equals zero. And then we can have a proof of a proof of a proof, a proof pi two that c of z is equal to zero and I know a proof pi one which proves that c of y is equal to zero and knowledge of a proof pi zero that c of x equals zero and so on and so forth. And this proof of a proof of a proof is still the exact same size and takes exactly the same time to verify. It's mind boggling, but it gives us something very, for, very powerful, which is a constant size blockchain. So let's contrast this with the ZK rollup application that we saw a few slides ago. Remember there, a server processes 1000 transactions and sends the, say, uh, the overall state change to the blockchain along with a proof of knowledge of these 1000 um, valid transactions. And then the, the validators who have not actually done this work can just verify that proof. But the blockchain constant content will still grow linearly over time. It's just that we've taken every 1000 block of transactions and compressed them. And syncing with the blockchain would still require verifying many historical snark proofs, say for every 1000 transactions. In contrast, a constant size blockchain has the property that the blockchain always has just one snark proof, which proves the historical validity of all transactions in the blockchain. So this is based on recursive proofs, which we just explained. So the con the, how does this work? So upon each state transition, the blockchain proof is replaced with a new snark that proves both the correctness of the most recent transition and the existence and correctness of a previous snark, which so on and so forth proved correctness of the previous transition and the existence of a snark proof, etc. In summary, we looked at payment and state channels, which drastically reduce the transactions that need to hit the blockchain. We looked at charting methods, which load balance both the validation of transactions and the state storage. We looked at state commitments and how they're a key sharding tool for enabling a flexible role of for example, nodes contributing to data availability, uh, data availability versus nodes participating in consensus or validation. We saw that in the extreme case, data could even just be spread over the users and none of the validators participating in validation or consensus would actually need to use any storage. And we also looked at SNARKs, which are a key sharding tool for enabling proving the validity of a large block of transactions with a small proof that can be verified without the underlying data and faster than verifying it directly. So that concludes lecture eight. In the next two lectures, we'll finally jump into the topic of distributed governance and we'll look at algorithmic consensus protocols. Thank you.